So many people are coming out of religious ministries, churches. So many people get their religion from YouTube. But what they speak of with God is not about hope. It's not about certainty. It's about trying harder and hoping for the best. And so often I hear people who describe having a religious high. And I know full well that religious high is going to become another human low. Because the story being told is all about human success. That won't hold up for the long run. I need something from God's word. Let's put this in perspective. Paul the Apostle writes 2 Corinthians to us. And he's telling us about the new ministry. The new ministry is the ministry of the gospel. The old ministry that was alive in the world and great in its time was the ministry of the law. Moses was the one who brought that. And the ministry of God under the law was solid. It was good. It's just that it was often misinterpreted by people. Uh, Pastor John has done a wonderful job in uh, the Power Hour from the book of Hebrews because this is the very problem dealt with in that book, that hope had been taken away. Hope had been replaced for these believers because they had taken their eyes or were taking their eyes off of Jesus, and they were, they were again looking at the law. Well, the problem with the law is the law can't save. The law can only condemn. And the law doesn't give anybody any certainty of eternal life. The law can only give people a certainty of condemnation. So why on earth would anyone take their eyes off Christ and look at the law? Well, it's the dog returning to his vomit, which is an ugly sight. But look with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse number 7, he says, But if the ministration of death, what's that? It's the law. It's the law. That's Moses' Ten Commandments and the sacrificial system of all those animals dying and, and being bled for sin. Paul the Apostle looks back on it and calls it the ministry of death. And thank God he gets to report good news that it was glorious, but it's passed away. If the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away? What he's talking about is when Moses brought the Ten Commandments on stone. Remember, remember this. In the, in the movie, if you saw Charlton Heston, the great Charlton Heston, play that role. He carried those stones like that down that mountain and... Uh, the face of Moses was glowing. You remember this? Well, no wonder, because he'd been face to face with God on that mountain. And the glory of God had gotten onto Moses. He's wearing it on his face. And when he got down to the people, they couldn't look at him. They, they couldn't look at him. He was glowing, and it was very bothersome to them. And so he had to put a veil over his face just to talk to them. How's that? And yet, what Paul is saying is, if Moses was glowing so much over receiving the law, how much more glorious is the receiving of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is not a ministry of death, it's a ministry of life. Is that good? Is that good? Verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, what's that? The law. That's the law. Paul calls it the ministry of condemnation. Because the law could never save anybody, could it? All those laws never save anyone. Well, why did God give the law anyway if it couldn't save anybody? Well, he gave the law for two reasons. Number one. God needed Israel to, to stick together. God needed that nation to be his headquarters in the world while God did spiritual work. And if that headquarters nation, Israel, gets splintered, or if they visit other nations or intermarry with them, they start, they start going knucklehead for God. They start marrying the wives of other nations 
And they may begin to serve false gods that other nations had. So it's a very practical reason. God needed a way to hold Israel together. So he gave it law. Number two, the law was a schoolmaster. It was a school teacher. It stood in front of the classroom all day long, all night long, and said, you're wrong, you're wrong, wrong, you're wrong too. You're wrong too, wrong, 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 and you're all condemned because of me. How on earth could anyone get ultra excited about the law after Jesus Christ comes and the Bible says of him, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But that's what was happening in the book of Hebrews. It's what was uh, apparently Paul was afraid would happen here. It had happened in other places. There was an outbreak of this in the early church. Believe me when I tell you there's an outbreak of it today. It's the idea of man examining himself according to law to see if he's saved or not. And that is a ministry of absolute death. That will get you condemned. Now, if you're truly saved and, and become confused later, that would not cause God to condemn you if your faith formerly had rested in Christ. But you'll condemn yourself. you condemn yourself. And once a person condemns themselves to religion, what an awful train ride that's going to be. I want to walk in the glory of God. How about you? For if the ministration, verse 9, of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness. What's that? The ministration of righteousness. That's the gospel of Christ. You're a little slow this morning. You should have been in camp all week. The ministration of righteousness. Why is it called that? Because the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So rather than try and stuff ourselves into the stone cold law, we have the opportunity by faith to put ourselves into Christ. And in Christ, I'm a righteous person. Hmm? Does that mean I always do all the right things? Oh, of course not. Of course not. The Bible says that anybody who says we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Hmm? But my sin now is already covered. My sin has already been paid. My, my sin is the very thing that Jesus Christ took on. And because he died for my sin, my sin doesn't have to be paid by me. One of these days you're going to get excited about this. <laughs> Verse 11, for if that which is done away, what's that? Law, law. If that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth, what's that? The gospel is glorious. So what was done away, no glory. It was glorious, but not anymore. Because now the most glorious revelation that human beings have ever received, the gospel, has come into the world. And this was so good, it's so much brighter so much more glory than anything Moses ever handled that came from God. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. What's he saying? Paul is saying that when Moses appeared to them and he had to put a veil up so that they didn't, they didn't get the glory. They didn't get a full shot of the glory. It was bothersome to them. They couldn't take it. He said the same thing still exists today. That some people cannot see the glory of God revealed in the gospel. Why? Because there's a veil. Because there's a veil up between. Do you know what would take the veil away? Faith in that gospel message. That's what would take that veil away. Faith. But let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a world that has just been drowning in religious words. Absolutely drowning in religious ideas. The world religions have 
have made millions of converts to world religion all based on what can you do for God. And if you do enough for God, well, you can get in with God, whatever that means, at heaven or some place or some state of being. But if you don't do enough, you, you can't earn what you could if you only did enough. That's, that's the message of the false religions of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, if you change the God of that religion with the true God, the way to get to him is still not through the same means that the false religions teach. There are so many Christian people who are teaching a message that is very similar to the cults, except they just have the right God in place. But you don't get to God by doing Christian things. This is, this is the muddying of the waters that Paul is talking about when he says, since we have such great hope, we use great plainness of speech. And the plainness of our speech needs to sound so different than the world religion. The sparkling difference in what the Bible says than all false religions is that Jesus is the way. No one else has anybody like him. No one else has anybody who ever came and said, I'm taking your sin, bear it in my body, die on a cross for you. No one has him. No one else out there who's teaching somebody's law in order to get to the next level. Nobody has anybody who rose from the dead. We have a Savior who was dead in the grave three days and three nights who's alive and is documented in human history. That's the sparkling difference between what the religions teach and what we have. So if we have a Savior who did it all, why on earth would our message ever sound like a religious message that leaves people leaving camp, leaving church, leaving Bible study, leaving whatever, thinking, as long as I keep doing well, I'm in with God. But if I don't do... Are, are you kidding me? Who are these people trusting in for their eternal life? Jesus or themselves? Now look, we're not, we're not mad at anybody who's, who's been deceived in that way. My heart goes out to them. I'm begging people for help. Help because they don't know how to ask. They don't know how to ask for help. They don't know what to say. They think that what they have is the best God has to offer, which is to tell us ways to live. Make no mistake, God does have a way to live for people. The Bible is full of God's instructions. The Bible has a long list of things we shouldn't do, and the Bible has a long list of things we ought to do. But before anybody can live in a godly way, they need to be born. And the only way to be born is by faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing else. Look, God is not saying that he will save us by faith in Christ plus our very best effort in the Christian life. Is that good news to you? Is that good? Does it leave you with the certainty of eternal life and the certainty that though this world is losing its mind, this world is coming apart at the seams, but God's not. He's on the throne and God is today marching the good news of the gospel in all its full glory around the world by faithful people. You should pray for them. Make no mistake, the devil is on the loose today. You get a person who's teaching a clear gospel message that's full of the glory of God because it's a message of by, uh, salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. I will show you a person with a target on their back. Somebody's throwing rocks at that person. God help those who bring the true message of the gospel. And help us to not be pretenders playing religious games when a Savior has died on a cross to take away the sin of the world. Let me show you this. Let that hand represent you. Let my wallet represent your sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what religion can do for you right there. Leave you short of the glory of God. Paul the Apostle just wrote a whole chapter about the glory of God. And he said the glory of God is in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all have fallen short of it because of sin. There's God. Let that be God. He's holy. Has no sin. Full of glory. John the Apostle. 
Jesus' best friend in the world, said that Moses brought law into the world, and it was good. But, but truth and grace came by Jesus Christ. Moses gave it law. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh now, brought grace and truth into the world. Jesus Christ, who is very God, became sin for us. He died on the cross to pay for your sin, every, every sin, every sin of your life, past, present, future, all of it. He owned it all as his own, and he paid the true death penalty for it. It's all recorded in history. This is everything that the Bible was telling us was going to happen. And he, in person, right on time, fulfilled everything that was written of him. Hmm? Three days after dying a horrid death on the cross that paid for your sin forever, Jesus rose from the dead. It, too, documented human history. And that barrier that was between us and God has been removed. You could have everlasting life because your sins are all paid. You could know that it's everlasting because there's no sin left by which God could use to condemn you. Is that good? That's glory. Never to be confused with the message being brought by the world's religions. The world's religions say do. The gospel of Christ says it's done. And the barrier's been taken away. The sin's all paid. It'll be everlasting life. Watch this with the Bible verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So let me ask you two questions today. Number one, are you certain that you're not condemned by God, but that you have everlasting life? If not, don't you want to be certain? Who, who, who would want to guess when you could have certainty? Well, you could have that certainty not by faith in you. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It'll be yours, and it'll be forever. You can never lose it. No one can steal it away.